Yes, I designed the original Fruit Ninja. I spent the last couple of weeks finding decade-old photos, old presentations, and blurry 360p footage from old YouTube to try and tell the story as well as possible. So, let's get started. It's 2009, and the iPhone 3GS is the latest and greatest in phone technology. It's also a built-in digital compass. At age 25, I am somehow running a team of seven at Halfbrick Studios. We had just released a game I had designed called Rocket Racing for the PSP. Rocket Racing was my first real original IP game, an insanely high skill ceiling futuristic racer. Oh hey, did you hear that? That ended up being part of the combo sound in Fruit Ninja. Anyway, the game did terribly and lost us a whole heap of money and this was not good. As a studio, we were trying to transition away from making licensed games to original IP and it was not going very well. The global financial crisis was in full swing and the whole studio was on the ropes. At some point, I sat down with the whole team and explained the situation. We had 12 months to make $300,000. Otherwise, we'd better start polishing our portfolios because we'd all be out of a job pretty soon. To try and help come up with new IP, the studio was running an initiative called Half Brick Fridays. Inspired by Google's 20% time, we could pitch a game idea to the entire company and then spend every second Friday working on prototypes for that game. The CEO of Half Brick Studios and my boss, Chenille Dio, asked us to really focus on iPhone games, games that could be played by anyone. I was racking my brain for something to pitch at Halfbrick Fridays, and all I really knew is I wanted to make the game that was the exact opposite of Rocket Racing. Something that was easy to play, grounded in the real world, and super intuitive. So I just sat down in front of a piece of paper and started to think through verbs of what interactions you could make with a touch screen. Tap, hold, drag, swipe? What's another word for swipe? Slice? And then all of a sudden, a whole bunch of things clicked into place in my brain. I remembered this old knife commercial that I'm watching at like 4 a.m. Slicing fruit in the air. It was perfect. And weirdly, the other thing that clicked into my brain was Quake 3. Specifically, the visceral satisfaction of fragging someone. Most iPhone games at the time had a really clean aesthetic, but I wanted something that was messy and satisfying. Something gory, if you can believe it. And slicing fruit, that was perfect for this. It could be G-rated gore. These are the first ever concepts for Fruit Ninja that I whipped up in about 30 minutes. And you can see how I wanted to lean hard on the gore angle from my original tagline for the game. The gore angle is actually something we held onto for quite a long time. And you can see it in one of these shirts that we really wanted to make, but I'm pretty sure this one didn't get made. Anyway, I pitched this to the whole company and mostly no one cared. Everyone thought it was too simple. We were a company of hardcore gamers. And to a lot of people, this was more like some kind of kid's toy. So it just kind of went on the back burner. Soon after, most of my team got moved to help get another licensed game over the line, but they just needed code and art no design help was required. This left myself and our other designer, Joe Gatling, kinda with nothing to do, other than figure out what project we should make next. And it needed to be something we could make really fast. We literally didn't have the time or money to make something that took a year or more. So we came up with a plan to make as many prototypes as we could in just two weeks. The theory was, if we couldn't make a prototype in just like a couple of days, it was probably too big of an idea for us to make really fast like we wanted to. So we sat down and came up with roughly 30 ideas for possible prototypes. And of course, we just threw Fruit Ninja into that mix. Using Flash and good old fashioned ActionScript, I love ActionScript, we prototyped a bunch of these really fast. And one of these was the original Fruit Ninja idea. This prototype built by Joe in just two days was instantly fun to play. The mouse wasn't ideal, but you got the idea. In fact, it was fun enough that we thought we'd try a spin-off as well called Canned Fruit Ninja. And that just was not nearly as good as original Fruit Ninja. 
At the end of the two weeks of prototyping, we picked the two prototypes that we thought held the most promise and decided to move them both into production at the same time. So we would split our team of seven down the middle and have half the team working on one and half the team working on the other. It was actually kind of complicated because a lot of things were moving at that time and I actually ended up being the lead designer on both prototypes at the same time, which was crazy. And of course, one of the games we ended up picking was Fruit Ninja. And the other one was what eventually became Monster Dash, which later was the starting point for Jetpack Joyride. Out of these two, Fruit Ninja was actually the risky one. We figured Monster Dash was kind of a safe bet because it was just basically cannibal with guns. So joining me on Team Fruit Ninja, we had Sharf, our artist, who had heaps of experience and who had been working with me for years. And we also had Steve, who at just 20 years old would be the sole programmer. Now I want to be clear here, there were lots of people who contributed to Fruit Ninja through the process. We had our sound designer, our producer, QA, we had marketing, we had the tech team who were building the engine we were using because we weren't using an off the shelf engine. And of course we had the support of my boss, but the base team who were making the game right at the start was myself, Sharth and Steve. So the three of us got to work and things started happening fast. Sharth created every single piece of art in a single shot. It was just like, Oh, fruit done, fruit done. There was no concepting or anything. It was because it was so easy to make, it just started, everything just flowed. Steve really quickly had the fruit popping up and the slicing mechanic working. And we invested a lot of our time trying to make the fruit splatters feel as appealing as possible. We had all three of us crowded around one iPhone 3GS, tweaking every single aspect of the particles and the effects. One of the really big design philosophies here was contrast bringing as much contrast as possible into every single aspect of the game. So for the background, I wanted something as plain and dark as possible so that the fruit splatters and the fruit themselves would just pop off of the background. And the same was true of our audio design with sound effects and music created by Jesse Higginson. Instead of just having a soundtrack playing in the background, we went with the ambient sounds of like a quiet zen garden so the impact and the pop and the splatter and carnage of the fruit would just stand out and contrast so much, making it really impactful. Back then, Fruit Ninja was so simple. There were no modes. Classic mode wasn't called classic mode. It was just the game. And it was so small that we obsessed over every single detail. Like we were super careful about how we designed the collisions for the fruit and the bombs. The fruit actually have a slightly oversized collision, while the bombs have a slightly undersized collision. The fruit also have priority in pushing the bombs out of the way, but the bombs can sneak in behind the fruit. It's this balancing act of making the game fair in some ways and a little bit unfair in others. I wanted it to be a little bit unfair because I wanted the player to have something to blame other than themselves when they didn't get a high score. Like, you could go, Damn it, if there just wasn't that bomb hiding behind that watermelon, I could have gotten my high score. That was all on purpose. Even the specifics of the RNG and the way that the fruit was spawned and the wave design had heaps of careful love and attention put into it. In fact, I've done an entire hour long talk at a conference before about that. At some point, Joe came up with the genius idea of making it so you had to slice a watermelon to start the game. And I just loved this. It instantly taught you how to play the game before you even started, so we added it right away. To do playtesting, our producer, Jason Harwood, would take the game down to a bus stop right down the road and just get people to play right there while they were waiting for their bus. We didn't want to test the game just with gamers, we wanted to test it on everyone. And because there were just so many people playing for such short bursts of time and giving just raw, unvarnished feedback, we were really able to get that starting experience as good as possible. One thing we quickly learned was no one knew how to use the menu. Everyone tried to tap the watermelon to start and then just gave the phone back like, oh, it's broken. So we just detected if anyone was trying to tap the watermelon and added a little hand swiping across it and boom, problem solved. And just like that, the game was done. In total, we had only spent six weeks on it from a blank project to a completed game ready to release. The next job was to come up with a marketing plan with our marketing manager, Phil Larson. 
At the start of 2010, everyone had started making really slick, high production trailers for their iPhone games. We didn't have any budget. We didn't have any production to throw at it. So we figured we would go the opposite way. We figured we would stand out by being as weird and indie and cheap as possible. So I bought about $20 worth of fruit, Phil rented out some goofy costumes from the costume shop, and we just ran around in a public park, acting like idiots for about an hour. And boom, that was the trailer done. A few weeks later, at the end of April 2010, we released the game. It didn't just blow up right away, it wasn't instantly a success. At the very beginning, it was making $100 per day, which wasn't enough to keep the lights on, but relative to some of our other projects, that was surprisingly good. On a Friday, it actually overtook Doodle Jump in the Australian charts. We were still really low everywhere else, but still, this was a huge accomplishment for us. We were super excited. So to celebrate, we sat around and had one, two, three, or maybe many more beers that evening. And then as the night was wrapping up, all of a sudden we saw an email come in. I have no idea why we had our email open, but we did. Anyway, the email was from Apple and they wanted to feature the game, which was an absolutely massive deal. The only problem was, was they needed the feature art like in a few hours. We needed to do it right away. Sharth had actually already gone home. So we had to call him back in and then with everyone with definitely more than a few beers under the belt, we actually put together the original Apple marketing promotion art for it. And once Apple featured the game, that's when things really started to pick up steam. We went from making $100 a day to $1,000 a day, and then a lot more. Steve and Sharth and I had this idea that when we hit 1 million fruit sliced, we were gonna have a party. First time that we checked that statistic, we'd hit 275 million fruit sliced already. But our work was far from over. We knew that the game was too small and too simple to hold people's interest for very long. So it was updating time and boy did we update. In the first 12 months, we shipped 14 updates for the game. And if you think that sounds stressful, you would be right. Early on, we were tracking all of the top requests for updates to the game. And there was a lot of interest in things like multi-slice and having the fruit separate really accurately. This was something I really pushed back on quite hard. And to me, adding complexity like this would have been the first step in eroding that foundation that made the game what it is. These were inevitably done by other games such as Veggie Samurai and I always felt like we had made the right decision by not going down this road. But a lot of people did suggest a no bombs zen mode and this was a great idea. We definitely did this. I knew that for zen mode to be interesting we needed something more than just slicing the fruit without bombs. So the obvious solution was to add combos. Before I even had a chance to sit down and design how the combo system would work, Steve just did it. He just came up to me and was like, hey, combos are done. I played it and it was literally perfect. We never changed a thing. It just, he nailed it first go. And as we made more and more updates, the game just continued to grow and grow. And before I knew it, we were celebrating 1 million copies sold, which just, none of us could ever have predicted that it would do so well. And of course, none of us had any idea that this was still just the beginning of the Fruit Ninja journey. And by this stage, the team had really grown. The number of people at the company working on Fruit Ninja in some form was massive. We needed versions for Android, Windows Phone, iPad, support for different features and tech. And this wasn't made in Unity or anything. This was a bespoke games engine. So making these ports was a lot of work. And during this period, so many people contributed, way more than I can honestly remember. But at its core, for mainline Fruit Ninja, it was still just the three of us banging out features and coming up with ideas. The next big update we did was Sensei's Swag. So we knew we wanted a shop where you could unlock blades and backgrounds. And the obvious solution for this is to have currency in the game that you could collect. We tried doing it where you sliced star fruit and these silver coins came out, but this just really didn't feel right to me. So instead we went with an achievement style unlocking system. And this was really fun because we could make all kinds of weird and subversive achievements for you to unlock the blades. So for example, to unlock Mr. Sparkle, 
you had to slice three pineapples in a row, which there was a chance you could do randomly, or if you read the achievement, you could do it pretty easily, but you needed to apply a little bit of strategy. And we had some really weird ones like, oh, you have to play the game upside down for a whole game. And we had other ones that didn't make it, like you have to play the game at night in complete darkness, and we would use the little light sensor at the front. That one didn't make it into the game because it meant we had to have the light sensor active the entire time you were playing, which used a bunch of battery. But anyway, it was really fun coming up with these. When we were designing the different background wallpapers you could have, we also had the idea of, oh, maybe you should be able to just pick whatever background you want from your camera roll. And we tested this and it just did not look right at all. It's funny now because this version of the dojo that worked in this way, I think only lasted the first two years. The shop itself and that whole system in Fruit Ninja has been changed heaps of times over the years. And so there's probably a bunch of people that don't even remember when it used to work this way. Next up, iOS 4.1 came along and that added real-time multiplayer matchmaking through Game Center. Hey, remember when Game Center had the crazy pool table aesthetic? Ah, those were the days. And so to be at the front of that wave, we really quickly smashed out multiplayer in just a couple of weeks. I think in total, I had about four days to design how the actual mode would work. And then Steve plus some other programmers just went through and absolutely smashed it out so fast so that we could be one of the first real-time multiplayer game center games. This mode has not existed for a long time. And I had a really hard time even finding any footage of it. We also had another mode planned that we'd been teasing through this mystery banana mode, which is what would eventually become arcade mode. And eventually that became the most popular part of the game when we released it and really gave it a new uptick in trajectory, but still that didn't exist yet. This ended up being a huge lift. It took over three months to design arcade mode and that was more than twice as long as it took to make the entire first version of the game. It was heavily inspired by Bejeweled Blitz on Facebook with its crazy exponential scoring, deep power-up system, and 60 second game mode time. But everything that I tried to make something like this just didn't feel right. Once again, we tried the currency that we could use to unlock and buy power-ups for each round of arcade mode. I just hated having coins and stuff in the game. It just felt so wrong to me. And I did want the game to be deep and have complexity, but I still wanted it to feel really raw and really pure. And by now you're probably sensing a pattern in how I approached the design for these early days of Fruit Ninja. I was fiercely protective of the core of Fruit Ninja and had a very clear vision for how I thought the game should feel. And I never really thought about the business side of things at all. I just wanted the game to be how I imagined it should be. Earlier versions of arcade mode also had a lot more information on the screen, such as a bar showing you how long the power-up bananas would last. More and more I stripped that back, making it as simple yet as deep as possible. And I'm still insanely proud of how arcade mode turned out. During these early days, there was also a bunch of Fruit Ninja stuff that we made that no one ever saw. For example, we developed a medical version of Fruit Ninja along with Neuroscience Australia that was to be used for a stroke rehabilitation program in hospitals. We worked with a doctor to include modes to make the game easier and even had functionality for exporting that data into the patient's medical records. About two years later, sometime after the pomegranate update, Myself and my team, we were just cooked. We were so sick of working on Fruit Ninja by this point. We had shipped a huge amount of updates in the last 24 months and under immense pressure. But really the main thing was, I just didn't have the will or the energy to keep working on Fruit Ninja. By this point, Jetpack Joyride had also taken off and that was taking a lot of my focus and attention. And I just couldn't give Fruit Ninja the love it deserved. And I was also more excited about developing whatever the next new IP would be. So eventually we worked out a plan and handed off the entire Fruit Ninja project to another team at Half Brick. And from there, the game has just kept going and going and going. Handing the project off and letting go of the creative control of Fruit Ninja was really hard for me. It was like my baby. And it was something that I really loved. I deeply cared about this project. But at the end of the day, Fruit Ninja isn't my baby. It's a product that's owned by a business. And so when the big changes started coming in, of course I didn't like that. It progressively transformed from what I wanted it to be to what the business needed it to be. 
And that makes complete sense, but it still really was hard for me to watch. Fruit Ninja changed my career in a massive way. Soon after, I was promoted to Chief Creative Officer. I got invited to speak at conferences and even won a few awards. And realistically, it's the game that I will always be known for. It's always gonna be the top game on my portfolio, right? There's no way that anything really can come close to that level of success. Although I guess Jetpack Joyride did get pretty close. What it didn't do though, was make me rich. I think a lot of people just assume that I owned Half Rick Studios and not realizing that it was quite a big company. And at the end of the day, I was an employee. I got a bunch of pay rises and got a few good bonuses. And so that was great. But this wasn't like, oh, I can retire now money, not by any means. It was enough that I could put a deposit on a mortgage. And this was kind of hard when I quit Half Brick to start pretty great along with Phil and Hugh. We'd flown to San Francisco to GDC to try and get investors to fund our new studio. And a lot of people were just like, why aren't you funding it yourself? You've got all this Fruit Ninja money. People assumed we were living large and just spending money like millionaires. But the reality was we were staying in a dorm room in a hostel and paying for everything on our credit cards. When we did finally get funding for pretty great, I had zero dollars in my bank account. But at the same time, Fruit Ninja got us into the room with those investors. People knew who we were and we had a reputation and then that had huge value. So it's complicated. Fruit Ninja changed my life and my career in a massive way, but not necessarily the way people expect all the time. The best part of the whole thing was how much Half Brick grew and how many new opportunities, especially for local developers, Fruit Ninja created. And now after 13 years, Fruit Ninja has been worked on by so many people. There are many talented developers who have all helped make it the phenomenon that it is today. But despite all that great stuff, there's always that part of me that wanted Fruit Ninja to just be that single, pure, perfect idea. No compromises, no characters, no spin-offs, no currency. Just that original little nugget of brutally murdering fruit. This is about as good as I could do on this story without making it about six hours long. There's so many details and like other stories involved, but it's just, this is already a long video, right? So. Thank you very much for watching. I don't want to spend too much time just looking backwards, but if enough people like this video, then maybe I'll do a similar one about Jetpack Joyride as well. If that sounds good to you, definitely leave a comment, subscribe so you don't miss out. I have a new game that I'm working on called Feed the Deep. You should check that out on Steam and wishlist it and all that jazz. And thanks to everyone that's been leaving comments and questions about this for me. It really helped me form the basis for this video. So yeah, thanks for watching.